بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to Quran Convos This is a podcast at Yaqeen Institute where we'll be exploring the many different ways in which you can connect with the Quran And every season as you'll notice inshallah ta'ala we'll be exploring different themes different aspects that relate to the Quran starting with season one covering the topic of tadabbur how to contemplate deeply on the Quran in the hopes of getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We'll be covering inshallah ta'ala the 10 inward acts of recitation. And this is from the works of Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah. This is one way for us to understand the meanings of the Quran, to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his speech and to hopefully act upon what we are learning within the ta'ala. We have with us, alhamdulillah, a number of experts and scholars and specialists who will be joining us with every episode, bi-ibnillahi ta'ala. And today we are starting off, inshallah ta'ala, with some excitement. We have with us, alhamdulillah, Sheikh Arsalan Haq and Sheikh Jamal Diwan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them both. Welcome to Quran Convos, Sheikh Jamal and Sheikh Arsalan. How are you doing today? Jazakumullah khairan, alhamdulillah. It's nice to be here. Alhamdulillah, barakallahu fikum. Before we start, I actually have a personal question for you both, Mashaikh. Uh, this is a question that will help us, inshallah ta'ala, motivate many of the listeners from around the world who are in different places on their journey to connecting with the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So maybe we'll start with uh, Sheikh Absalan, if you can give us maybe an example, uh, one instance in your life in which reading the Quran or listening to the Quran evoked a deep or emotional reaction from you uh, perhaps if you're comfortable sharing something that's, uh, you know, in inspirational for those who are trying to get to a point where listening to the Quran uh, for them is a way to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as intended by the Quran. So maybe something that was happening or something that you heard or something that you recited, how did it make you feel? What did it make you think about? Well, I think, uh, you know, there are so many occasions that come to mind. Uh, sometimes it has to do with a particular condition which I'm facing in life. And then I read something or or listen to something in Salah or in my car. Um, or sometimes it's simply uh, the reciter and the, uh, the emotion with which uh, the Quran is being recited. Uh, is there's so many occasions but one that you know comes to mind right now is um uh, subhanallah <clears throat> when the uh, pandemic started uh, a couple of years ago i remember very clearly that uh, <clears throat> i was uh, in the masjid and uh, i was reading the quran <clears throat> and just at that time i happened to be reading surat al-an'am and uh, in the middle of the seventh juz uh, right at the middle point, uh, like this is ayah number 30 something of Surah Al-An'am. And I started reading and I felt like every single ayah for like the next four or five pages, subhanAllah, was talking to me about what I was feeling through the pandemic, uh, the uncertainty, the you know, uh, what we were hearing in the news about how deadly this virus can be and and the lockdown that was starting uh, and the ayat that were coming. SubhanAllah, every single ayah in that passage for about five pages, I remember, uh, was, I felt like giving me a different direct message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about what this means, uh, what this is all about, and what we are expected to do during this time, subhanAllah. And I mean, you know, the, re the, the listeners are welcome to go back and look at that passage to see what I'm talking about. But basically, in a nutshell, the, the, the thing that really reverberates in that, in that passage is the need to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with tadarru, with dua, and imploring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and realizing that nothing is going to help us get out of this situation except him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakumullah khairan, Shaykh, for sharing that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. That's a beautiful example. Shaykh Jamal, same question, if there's something you can share similar to that. Barakallahu alaykum. Sure. Bismillah, 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 Bismillah. 
Uh, actually, the incident that comes to mind for me the most is something that happened when I was in Egypt. And it needs a little bit of background, but I'll try to make it as quick as possible, uh, which is that <clears throat> in Cairo, many people might know that there's a good portion of the city that is basically people living in a graveyard. That's an extended area of graveyards, and it's not how we would conceptualize it in America. You can find pictures online and videos and stuff, but they live in this area. And so it was a Friday, and I was at Azhar Park, which is across the street from these graveyards. It's a very nice park and whatever, and and uh, Juma time came, and the people in the park told us they don't have Juma in the park, which, you know, whatever, we'll leave comments on that for now. <laughs> so they said you have to go find a masjid outside. So when we left the park, and we started to see people walking uh, towards the graves, so we knew there's a Juma over there, you hear sounds, you can hear the megaphones and stuff, the microphones. So I followed the people, and I started to walk into this area where the graves are. And I'm just kind of following the people and following the sound. And I hear some recitation. And after a few minutes walking and weaving and turning in a little bit, and I came upon this masjid and I could hear this recitation of the Quran as I was coming in that was just uh, out of this world. You know, I just felt like this Qadi, whoever he is, it's as if he's truly reading from his soul. You know, like it's really leaving straight from the heart and coming out of his mouth, subhanAllah. And uh, so finally, I get into the masjid and I walk in and I see the sheikh sitting there. And he's like a very old man, very skinny, very frail, and completely blind. And he's just sitting there. And wallahi, I looked at him and I felt like he's in a different world. SubhanAllah. He was reading the Quran in such a beautiful way. And um, so that was just a very moving experience. Um, many years later, actually, I found some recordings of his on YouTube. Now YouTube has everything. SubhanAllah, Shaykh Mahmoud Esran, Allah Um, You can find some of the maqarit, the, uh, some gatherings of recitation, and there's some clips of his recitation if anyone wants to find it. Uh, but it was very beautiful, SubhanAllah. Jazakum khairan for sharing that, Shaykh. Barakallahu feekum. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept. SubhanAllah, those times in which we, we come across uh, moments like this or encounter moments like this with an individual or groups uh, or people who may not be even uh, known around the world. Uh, their names are mentioned in the heavens as they are connecting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his revelation. Uh, this brings us really to the first advice of Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah, which is to have magnification of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we recite. Oftentimes many people are reciting as a habit or reciting very quickly reciting without much focus. And so we can start with this first advice of Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah, which is to think about the, the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to magnify uh, the, the speaker, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who revealed this to us out of his mercy for our own benefit, for our own blessing, for our own guidance, our own salvation. So we want to think about how magnifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala improves our ability to uh, connect with the Qur'an. And oftentimes we don't realize that the blessing of just being able to recite and listen to the Quran is a blessing in and of itself that requires its own episode. Uh, an example of this, I'll share a story as well. Approximately 10 years ago, after witted prayer in the masjid, in the month of Ramadan, a young man comes up and he was about 16 or 17 years old. And it looked like he had just stopped crying, like he had been, been crying in the prayer. So I said salam to him and he didn't respond. He took out one of those phones back then that had the, the keyboards on the side and he started typing very quickly. So I realized as he was kind of responding with lips and like, you know, uh, writing on, on the phone that uh, he wasn't uh, able to hear. He was deaf. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless this brother. His story really affected me and affected many people after that. He introduced himself. He told me who he was. He said when he was 16 years old. Uh, several years before this, his mother had really, really been motivating him, pushing him to recite and memorize the Qur'an. Not a day can go by without you connecting to the Qur'an. And connect to it because it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's speech. These are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So she would always motivate him. He felt a strong attachment to the Qur'an, a strong love for the Qur'an, a strong love and a connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through it. And he said, I didn't know where this came from, but the encouragement from my mother made a huge difference. When he was 16 years old, he, he was kind of finishing up his ijaza. He had just finished reciting the last parts of what he had memorized. He finished reciting to his teacher. And approximately a week after he finished and he received his certificate and everything else, 
he lost the ability to hear. He said, now I can't hear the Quran. Now it's as though sometimes in the month of Ramadan, it's as though I can distantly hear it, but I'm not even, you know, I'm not even sure I can hear it. He said, when I feel like I can hear the Quran in Ramadan, I start to cry. And I'm not ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm grateful that he gave me the blessing of finishing memorizing the Quran before I lost the ability to hear. SubhanAllah, when he said this, it just it made me feel that we are uh, oftentimes ungrateful, not appreciative for the blessing of being able to open the Mus'haf anytime we want and in our times as well to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through listening to the Quran. We are living in the generation of a blessing that no previous generations used to have, which is access to millions of recordings of Quran anytime we want. An example uh, is the one that Sheikh Jamal just mentioned of looking up a recording. We, we, we speak of it so naturally, we don't realize what a blessing it is. So how do we get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through this advice in particular, the advice of Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah of magnifying the speaker? What are some things we can take from this uh, perhaps uh, we can start with Sheikh Arsalan and Sheikh Jaman, inshallah. Um, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> if you if you look at the passage of Imam Al Ghazali, rahimahullah Taala, he uh, talks about this by saying that first we need to realize that what we are reading, the Quran, or what we are listening to, the Quran. Um, is the kalam of Allah, is the speech of Allah. And so just to pause and reflect on what that means, it's the speech of Allah. You know, um, it's it's not just an expression that's supposed to sound nice. It, it, it's a very, very deep concept. Allah's speech as, as Muslims, as Sunni Muslims, we believe that Allah's speech is one of his divine attributes. And uh, when it comes to the divine attributes, we believe in all of Allah's divine attributes that are mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah, while realizing that they are utterly different from human attributes. So Allah is attributed with knowledge, for example, uh, and human beings are attributed with knowledge, but Allah's knowledge is unlike our knowledge. Our knowledge is something that grows and shrinks. Uh, we don't know and then we learn and then we know and then we forget and we no longer know um uh, we can know something and then we can know more about it but allah's knowledge is not like that allah's knowledge does not grow or shrink allah's knowledge um is 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 not increasing or decreasing uh, allah doesn't forget so uh sometimes even though we we use the same word to describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we do to describe human beings, we understand that the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are utterly different from human attributes. Uh, so when we say that, you know, the speech of Allah, we of course have to understand that, you know, uh, this is a divine attribute and um, Allah's attributes, all of them are divine and we are mortals. And mortals can never understand the essence of the divine. You know, we are four-dimensional creatures. Our existence, our experiences are bound by time and space. Allah, God, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is beyond time and space. He is the creator of time and space. So the Quran that we read and that we hear contains the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The language of the Quran is four-dimensional language that contains and that communicates to us something that is incredible. It communicates to us the divine, uncreated speech of God, which is one of his essential attributes. And that's what Imam al-Ghazali emphasizes in his passage. And what that implies is that every time I read an ayah, or even a word, or even a letter of the Qur'an, I am directly interacting with Allah through one of his essential attributes, directly, without any intermediary. You see, I, we can't touch Allah. We cannot see him or hear him in this world. But we can hear and recite his divine, uncreated words that are couched in the three-dimensional 
language of the Quran. And that is very special. So uh, part of magnifying uh, the speaker is to realize that the speech itself is something incredible that is being communicated through to us through letters and words that we can understand, right? Alif, Lam, Mim, Ha, Mim, Ta, Sim, Mim, Qaf, Yasin. Allah even, you subhanAllah, uh, in a subtle way communicates that to us at the beginning of the various surah that look, I'm using this three-dimensional language that is something that you can understand to communicate to something communicate to you something that is divine that actually you could never directly experience. So I'm using language and expressions that you can relate to. And uh, Imam Ghazali also you know, gives an example of like when a human being communicates with a pet or an animal. You know, when you talk to an animal, uh, you talk to the animal in language that the animal can understand. You know, you use expressions and sounds that you wouldn't normally use, but you use them because that's what the animal understands. You know, uh, I remember uh, when I used to have a goat and, you know, I grew up in my childhood in Pakistan. And, you know, when, when you're trying the goat to make the goat eat something or drink something, make certain sounds, you try to entice the goat to that food or that, that drink so that it comes to you without being scared and it eats or drinks from that, make certain sounds. Uh, you don't, as a human being, don't normally talk like that, but you stoop down to the level of the animal and speak to the animal using sounds that the animal can understand. So God subhanahu wa ta'ala, Imam Ghazali is saying that God speaks to us in a language that we can understand, using expressions that we can relate to, out of his compassion for us. Not because he needs anything from us, but he wants us to benefit from the guidance that he, uh, he is giving to us. So I think part of this is, as Imam al-Ghazali is saying, is to realize the significance of what the Quran is, that it is the kalam of Allah, the divine speech of Allah couched in a language that we can understand. And part of it is also to understand who the mutakallim is, who the speaker is, Whose words are we reading? Who, who is he? He is the creator of the universe. He is the master of the universe. He is the creator of everything that we see and everything that we don't see. And that majestic grandeur being is the one whose words we are reading. And so the realization of that should help us show reverence to what we are reading and really turn to it with a sense of gratitude and a sense of, of uh, appreciation and eagerness to, to understand and to benefit from what is being communicated to us. Allahu Akbar. Barakallahu Sheikh. Uh, Sheikh Jamal, would you like to add uh, anything on that note as well, in terms of the, the uh, magnification of the divine speech as we uh, transition to the magnification for the speaker as well? Sure. Um, I mean, I think that, mashallah, Sheikh Arsalan really, um, express these concepts that sometimes people struggle with understanding uh, in a very beautiful way. MashaAllah, um, I, I just think that, and it's kind of related to the next one, is that uh, with many things, we, we often struggle with the transition between knowing something and experiencing it. And I think that this is one of our big challenges, is that we, we try to know at some level and understand uh, what it means that we're talking about the speech of Allah or that Allah is speaking to us in a sense through the Quran. Um, but I think that part of that for us practically is to uh, try to feel that at some level. And I think that what that often requires from us is some pause and some reflection. And uh, that's part of preparing ourselves for our experience with the Quran. And uh, subhanAllah, when we look at life, this, this idea recurs many times, you know, we think about even the Hijra and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu uh, he wanted to go with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the Hijra, so he prepared the camels in advance, right? So in order to really experience the Hijra, there's things he has to do before the Hijra. 
uh, when we come to Salat, we make wudu, you know, and there's there's a preparation in that wudu for the Salat. And I think that this point that we're on right now and, and the one after it is also like if we want to really experience the Qur'an, we have to take that moment and kind of uh, really ground ourselves in what am I doing right now? Uh, because I think a lot of what we end up, the way that we end up living our lives is very, you know, we do one thing to the next and we check off the next thing. And But to really stop and say, okay, so what am I doing right now? I'm reciting the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm reading, uh, you know, the, the Quran. And this is this is a really special thing. And to bring to mind all the things that Sheikh Arsalan mentioned and to allow them, I, I, I in my head, the image I try to think about is like, I have these certain ideas in my head. And I want to kind of like let them sit there long enough and stop long enough until they fall into my heart. So I have them up here and I let them kind of, I take a moment and I let them settle in my heart. And then after that, we can read the book of Allah, inshallah, and benefit from it. May Allah subhanahu wa reward you both. Very comprehensive uh, insights for us to, to reflect on. Uh, one time with a number of youth, uh, with a similar analogy, we were talking about the example of uh, influence and imitation and emulation and how a lot of people look up to individuals that don't benefit them in a dunya or in the akhirah. And then this really sparked the question about uh, correspondence, a message. So we asked if somebody were to send you a message, someone really famous that you love and you admire, someone you respect, someone you would love to meet, they sent you a video message. Uh, let's say it's a, a righteous scholar, a just ruler. Let's say it's a uh, practicing pious Muslim celebrity, someone sent you a message, somebody wanted to call you, somebody wants to send you a text message, or they sent you a gift, would you value it? Would you ignore it? Would you delete it, leave it unread? Would you download the message right away? Would you preserve it? In all likelihood, most likely, if you really love such a person, that message is going to be read, it's going to be pondered, depending on who it's coming from, it's going to be cherished. It's a very clumsy and small analogy. Uh, but Al-Hasan Al-Basri, rahimahullah, he says, the people before you consider the Qur'an to be correspondence from their Lord, so they would ponder upon it by night and act upon it by day. And really, if you think about the Qur'an as coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it changes the way you interact with it. But oftentimes, again, it becomes a, a habit where we're just reciting and we start to become distracted from the, the essence of it all. So before we begin with the daily recitation of Qur'an or listening to it, perhaps it's a reminder for those who are starting this practice to reflect for a moment I'm about to engage with the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm about to engage with the, the creator of the universe, the one who brought me into existence, the one who forgives, the one who uh, accepts repentance, the one who admits his servants into paradise, the one who is watching and hearing and all seeing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with so many things. So as we're engaging with his speech, it's a reminder for us, this is correspondence from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's engage with it as such. And Jazakumullah Khair and Sheikh Jamal uh, and Sheikh Arsana, you perfectly transitioned us to uh, the second point, which is the magnification of or for the speaker in the Quran. And so now we're thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking to us and how are we interacting with that? Uh, perhaps we can sh uh, start now with Sheikh Jamal. What are some ways for us to think about uh, tadabbur in light of knowing that the one who's speaking to us is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So does thinking of the speaker help with our connection to the Qur'an, our deeper, hopefully, connection to the Qur'an, and what are some ways we can uh, increase our tadabbur by knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the speaker? Yeah. Um, so what comes to mind for me is something that I heard one time about Salat, and it's, I think there's a connection here, is that one of the mashayikh was saying that oftentimes we'll find that one of the ways to better our experience of salah is to better our relationship with Allah outside of salah. And so I think that part of, you know, this understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and connecting to Allah and how that helps us in our relationship with the Quran, one of the ways that we can do that is to really try to live and experience our relationship with Allah when we're not reading the Quran. So to, for example, just a couple small things and, um, you know, two, two small points. The first, I think the first way we can do that is to be, to try to be people of dhikr, to try to be people who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we go about our day and maybe there's certain dua that we make at different times from the example of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that, of course, is going to remind us of Allah. 
we go through our days and we say la ilaha illallah we go through our days we maybe see beautiful things that happen around us and we say subhanallah we go through our day and we see things that we're grateful for and we say alhamdulillah and so all of that zad so to speak that provision that we get from that remembrance during the day and that lived experience with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we come to read his book now we're going to engage with his book in a different way because uh, we've been strengthening that relationship throughout uh, our, our everyday experiences and I think that one of the and related to that I think one of the ways to really do that is to try to find righteous people to be around and I know that this is being around people in general is something that's a lot less than it used to be. But if we can try to be around righteous people, and it might not, it doesn't have to always be what we kind of like immediately comes to mind. You know, someone's like, spend time with righteous people, and everyone's like, okay, there's the Sheikh. I have to spend time with Sheikh, you know. But mashallah, the Ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is, is blessed. And there's many, many righteous and beautiful people in the Ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I'm just thinking about some people in our own lives who, you know, nobody, they're just maybe like family members or stuff like this. And, um, but they say really beautiful things and they really have a beautiful relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, and through conversation with them, you see it. You'll see like every time they mention something, they'll say, Allah is so merciful. Allah is so generous. They might start crying because they're just thinking about how generous Allah is and how merciful Allah is. And you might have, like certain phrases and certain cultures, by the way, I mean, this is part of maybe I, I don't have a particular culture that I was raised in, but I've seen different things that I'm like, oh, this is a beautiful thing from that culture. Like, for example, I've heard um, Afghans will, will often say this phrase that Khodawan Mirabanus, like he's Allah is very generous. Allah is so, so generous. And so he's just always giving to his creation. And so in the course of conversation, you hear these statements and you're like, subhanAllah, he really is, you know. And so then when we come to his, come to his words, or you, you hear people tell stories about their lives, moments when they realized where, you know, just in the course of regular conversation, uh, I realized in this moment, Allah was taking care of me, or Allah was helping me with this, or Allah was helping me with that. So then when I come to his book, I have a kind of a different experience with the book when I'm reading the book, because I'm, I'm seeing the whole thing in a different way. So uh, that's just, you know, some immediate thoughts that come to mind on that. Uh, Sheikh Arsalan, uh, thoughts on, you know, thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how that assists us with tadabbur. Well, um, I remember, you know, I had a, um, when I was, when I was in college, I had an imam uh, who was from Saudi Arabia. And uh, he was telling us a story in Ramadan of something that he had experienced that's very much related to the question that you're asking. He said that uh, since he was from Saudi Arabia, he said that uh, when he used to live in Saudi Arabia, he used to love to go to uh, the Haram in Mecca uh, during the last 10 nights of Ramadan and do Atikaf there. So he said one Ramadan while he was um, in Al Masjid Al Haram. And he was praying Taraweeh on the second floor, close to the balcony. He said, <clears throat> the Imam was reciting. And just next to me, there was a man from China. And he was sobbing in the prayer, just sobbing. <clears throat> and so this, my Imam, he, he thought to himself, SubhanAllah, a brother from China understands the Quran because Obviously, he was moved by the passage that was being recited. And so he, he after the Salah finished, he, he wanted to talk to the Chinese brother to get to know him. So he started talking to him in Arabic, and very quickly he realized that the Chinese brother did not understand Arabic. So now there's this awkwardness, and then the Imam tried to talk to him in English, and the Chinese brother knew English. So then they started to communicate. And uh, my sheikh, uh, the imam, he said, you know, uh, I noticed that you were so emotional uh, in the salah, is everything okay? And uh, the brother said, uh, yeah, everything's fine. I was, just, uh, I was just overwhelmed by the realization who it is that I'm standing in front of. 
And I was overwhelmed by that emotion. And that's what was causing me to cry. So he doesn't understand what is being recited, but just the thought of who it is before whom he is standing is enough for his tadabbur, you see. And that's really the idea that Imam Ghazali is, is trying to emphasize here that when we recite the Quran, we just have to realize who it is that we are talking to, who it is that's talking to us. And I, I, I don't want to for, for our listeners to feel overwhelmed by what we're saying because it might come across as, oh, I need to do so many things before I read the Quran, so this is too hard. No, it's not that. It's not that you know you need to do A, B, C, D, like Imam Ghazali talks about 10 adab that are outward adab and 10 adab that were inward adab. And unless you do these 20 things and you, you're not ready to read the Quran, don't take it like that because just open the Quran and the Quran itself will help you get into uh, the, the, the emotion that you need to be. For example, we're talking about what we're talking about realizing who Allah is. We're talking about reverence and magnification of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, how much of the Quran talks about who Allah is, right? Almost one third or maybe more of the Quran actually talks about who Allah is, describes Allah, the qualities of Allah, the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So just read the Quran. The Quran itself will help you get into the mode that you need to be if you are just reading it with an open mind and an open heart. Wallahu a'ala. Barakallahu feekum, Shaykh. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from you. And, and yes, absolutely, for those who are listening, uh, none of this is to say that we, we are at a place of perfection. And once you reach the place of perfection, that's when you start to read the Quran or preparation. Rather, it's an ongoing journey of trying to improve, but it requires us to be connecting consistently and constantly. And in fact, there is nothing more reasonable for us to do than to start connecting to the Quran today on a daily basis in order for us to try to achieve that level of connection that we desire. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us uh, all with that and our loved ones and bless us to be amongst the people of the Quran. Allahumma ameen. On this kind of closing note, uh, we want to ask in a very practical sense, and I believe maybe the team will also cut this out, inshallah ta'ala, and benefit many more people with this clip. Uh, I'll ask both Mashayikh, if you had to give like a 10 or 20 second piece of advice, a practical advice for someone who's listening right now and they want to connect to the Quran, what's one practical advice that you would give? Maybe we can start with Sheikh Arsalan. Well, I think uh, what I would say is kind of what we started out with, which is be grateful for the tremendous honor that Allah has given you by inspiring you and enabling you to have access to the Quran and opening it and reading it and benefiting from it. Um, this is no small uh, gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, so, so be grateful for that tremendous honor, that tremendous blessing. Uh, SubhanAllah, you know, a few years ago, uh, I came across uh, a section in a book that I was reading that just, just it was mind blowing for me. Uh, and a lot of people don't know this, <clears throat> um, that uh, there are scholars who, 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 who believed that the angels are not able to read the Quran. The angels, except for Jibreel, are not given the ability by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to read the Quran. And this is an opinion that is mentioned by Ibn Salah in his Fatawi. And then it is uh, confirmed by Imam Suyuti. It is confirmed by Ibn Hajar al-Haytami and others. And they said that there are certain uh, uh, athar and ahadith that, that indicate this, that the angels are not able to read the Quran. And uh, one hadith that is mentioned that indicates that is the hadith that says that whenever people gather together to recite the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are angels that are going around the earth looking for these gatherings. And when they find these gatherings, they descend 
they come down and they surround those gatherings with their wings and listen to the Quran. So part of the reason is because they themselves cannot recite the Quran, so they are so attracted to the gatherings where the Quran is being recited. And so if that is true, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best because after all, this is a matter of the unseen, but according to these great authorities, this seems to be the case. So if that is true, that the angels, which are such pure creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that aside from Jibreel, the rest of them are not given this honor, this ability that Allah gave to the human being, the ability to, to recite his word, his speech, then I think that should cause us to feel tremendously honored and blessed. And, and the least that we can do is show appreciation for that and feel gratitude for that in our hearts as we open the Quran and, uh, and seek to benefit from it. That's beautiful. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and accept from you. Sheikh Jamal, same question for you. Barakallahu feekum. Yeah. Um, I mean, quickly, um, the first thing I would say is to just do it. Uh, the most important thing about having a relationship with the Quran is to just have a relationship with the Quran. Take some time each day, read it. Uh, when it comes to reading the Quran, you know, of course you can read in whatever language you understand, but there is a special merit and, and blessing in the Arabic. And I think that it's good for people to take some time and effort to learn how to read the Arabic properly and to really feel like, I'm reciting this Quran the way that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recited it, which is an incredible thing. When you, If we really sit and think about that, it's a really remarkable thing. So to recite it, but also to, uh, and try to memorize a little bit, you know, it doesn't necessarily that everyone has to be a Hafid, but uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us by meaning that uh, the heart that has Quran in it is not the heart that doesn't. So, you know, the, the heart without Quran in it is like a is like a dilapidated house, you know, a rundown house. So we should try to put a little bit of that Quran in our heart as much as we can, inshallah, and just take it step by step. And if we try to be consistent, and if we have times when we fall off and we're not consistent, we don't have to beat ourselves up over it. We can just come back and resume our relationship with the Book of Allah. And inshallah, if we do that, we'll start to see what we're reading and the different things that we experience in our days, inshallah. Shaykh. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. That's a beautiful closing advice. Uh, all I can really add uh, to this is uh, maybe one more uh, practical advice for those who became Muslim today and those who have been Muslim throughout your life, uh, regardless of whether or not you are fluent, uh, take advantage because at the end of the day, we don't know which day in this world will be our last. So read the Quran, Quran as though it's your last opportunity. And we had a brother, subhanAllah, maybe uh, seven years ago, was diagnosed with late stage cancer. And they told him he had several months to live. And he ended up passing away shortly after that. May Allah have mercy on him. When we visited him, when we spoke to him, it's as though he was living upon the advice of the Prophet wasallam. When a man came and asked for advice, say, when you stand to pray, pray as though you were bidding farewell. And he applied this advice to everything else. So he's saying, in other words, Every time I'm reading from the Mus'haf, every time I'm reading Quran, I feel like this is my last chance to read the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this quick life that we have. And so read the Quran as though it's your final opportunity. And remember that the Quran is a light for every darkness. It is guidance for every misguidance. Its beauty does not run out. Its sweetness does not end so long as you are reciting with an attentive heart. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us all, all the blessings that we can access through the Quran especially the blessing of guidance and shifa, healing for what is in the hearts and healing for our societies and our communities, and as well the commands for us to be people of justice and to uh, pursue justice for all of those who are struggling around the world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alleviate their affairs and utilize us for what is good in this life and reward us and guide others through us. Allahumma ameen. Shaykh Jamal and Shaykh Arsalan, jazakumullah khair and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from you. This does wrap up our first episode, alhamdulillah. Thank you for your time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put barakah in it. Perhaps, inshallah ta'ala, Sheikh Jamal and Sheikh Arsalan, when we get together, maybe we'll hoop, maybe we'll do jujitsu, maybe we'll have a barbecue with the youth, inshallah ta'ala. For our brothers and sisters who are listening from all around the world, may Allah bless you for your time. This first episode of Quran Convos has come to an end. But inshallah ta'ala, you can join us for the upcoming episodes and for more programs on the Yaqeen podcast. We'll see you soon, inshallah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.